welcome back to the channel and another episode of Immunology The War Is Over Season 2. Today we are talking all about mycophenolate. In this episode we'll uncover how does mycophenolate actually work and we'll also unveil some seriously fun facts about this drug that will stand you in good stead for exams and doctor life. And I'm going to tell you that there's more to mycophenolate than meets the eye. Let's jump right in. So once upon a time in this immunology series, I told you about B cells and T cells and how these proliferate during immune responses. If you're a little rusty on that, be sure to check out those episodes when you're done here. They are clarity in a basket and I'll leave the links below. But ultimately, the immune response from B cells and T cells involves proliferation. It involves cell division into armies of cells that will go forth to annihilate their target. So needless to say, these cells are going to be relying on their cell cycle and DNA synthesis in order to build clones of themselves and form their lymphocyte tribes. And this is where mycophenolate comes in. Mycophenolate is an anti-proliferative agent, which means that it inhibits the cell cycle and it does this by inhibiting an enzyme called IMPDH, which is involved in guanosine synthesis. Now, I don't know about you, but when it comes to molecular biochemistry, I can always do with a bit of a refresher course. Know what I'm saying? So for the record, I just want to briefly touch on what on earth is guanosine <laughs> and what does it actually do in this cell cycle situation. So when I hear the word guanosine, my brain instantly thinks about nucleotides, the little building blocks of DNA. But the building blocks of DNA are guanine, adenine, cytosine and thymine. But not guanosine because guanosine is slightly different. Guanosine is the combination of guanine bound to ribose and guanine can be phosphorylated and manipulated into various other versions of itself depending on how much phosphate we sprinkle in there or what other molecules we remove. And these various molecules which result from dressing up guanosine have various functional roles such as roles in the cell cycle, signal transduction, as well as splicing RNA which is important for protein synthesis. And so we can see on this diagram guanosine is needed for quite a few things within cells to make RNA and DNA and glycoprotein synthesis. But coming back to mycophenolate, we said that this drug blocks an enzyme important for guanosine synthesis and that enzyme is IMPDH. And so insert mycophenolate into this diagram and suddenly we have less guanosine, which means less cell cycle action, which we can use to inhibit proliferation of lymphocytes. And whilst this is a neat little package and we can definitely sum up mycophenolate as an anti-proliferative for our MCQs, it's rather an oversimplification. And I wanted to make sure that we gave mycophenolate a proper shout out here and credit where credit is due. Because something that's special about mycophenolate is how it preferentially inhibits lymphocytes in comparison to other cells in the body. So how does that work? The reason is because there are two different isoforms of this enzyme IMPDH, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is present in most cells in the body, whilst type 2 is predominantly present in, you guessed it, lymphocytes. And mycophenolate is five times more potent at inhibiting this type 2 isoform compared to type 1. And so mycophenolate's inhibition of activated lymphocytes happens for two reasons. One, these cells rely on proliferation, which mycophenolate will absolutely reduce. And two, Lymphocytes rely on the type 2 isoform of IMPDH, which mycophenolate preferentially blocks. And aside from inhibiting the cell cycle of T cells and B cells, 
Mycophenolate has also been shown to inhibit monocytes, meaning that less monocytes will transform into macrophages in tissues. And on top of this, mycophenolate has also been shown to influence the amount of adhesion molecules expressed by endothelium, which ultimately reduces the strength of an immune response at sites of inflammation. And so the combination of these effects makes mycophenolate a wonderful immunosuppressant that we currently use in transplant medicine, as well as in treating a whole host of autoimmune conditions. And now that we have that mechanism under our belts, I wanted to highlight some of the side effects of mycophenolate that we should watch out for. The most common side effects are cytopenias, or bone marrow suppression, because of that anti-proliferative effect. Another side effect is diarrhea. Diarrhea is a very common side effect of mycophenolate. Sometimes it'll settle, sometimes it will not. And of course, in a transplant patient or immunosuppressed patient with diarrhea, we have to think about other things like CMV colitis and the usual myriad of pathogens that can lead to diarrhea. So of course, you'll send off your stool microbiology samples and CMV PCR. And if things are not settling down, you might consider a colonoscopy to fully evaluate the problem. But in that process, if we don't find an infective cause, we might attribute the diarrhea to mycophenolate. And to reduce the diarrhea associated with mycophenolate, we have a couple of options. We can spread out their total mycophenolate dose. So instead of dosing one gram twice a day, you might dose 500 milligrams four times a day. Or you might change the preparation from the fast release mycophenolate to the slow release preparation. That sometimes helps. Or as a last resort, we sometimes switch the mycophenolate to azathioprine. And of course, if we're gonna do that, then we need to check those TPMT levels before we do so. Now, in terms of those various preparations, mycophenolic acid is the active ingredient, but it's given as a prodrug to boost bioavailability. And we have two forms of this drug we can prescribe. The first is mycophenolate mofetil, or Celsept, which is a prodrug converted to mycophenolic acid in the liver. And the second preparation is mycophenolate sodium, or myfortic, which is the slow release version of the drug. Now, this slow release version, we tend to crack out mainly for that diarrhea side effect when present. It's dosed twice a day, just like the immediate release tends to be. And the main downside of the slow release preparation is that you can't really check mycophenolate drug levels. So mycophenolate drug levels are performed as an area under the curve, not a trough level like you might expect. So to check the drug level of mycophenolate, you give the immediate release dose of the mycophenolate, and then you check the blood levels of the drug at regular intervals over the next few hours. And those values are used to calculate the area under the curve. At our hospital, this is done routinely in the first week or so post-transplant to fine-tune their drug dose right at the start. And it can be done again in future when adjusting immunosuppression for various reasons. So that's some handy pharmacological aspects to be aware of. But some of you might be wondering about the difference between mycophenolate and azathioprine. Now, I'll be making a dedicated video on azathioprine because it has a few quirks to be aware of for MCQs and clinical practice. But here, I'll just give you the highlights. Azathioprine is also an anti-proliferative agent which interferes with the cell cycle, but the way in which it does this is non-selective. And so it not only blocks enzymes involved in purine synthesis, it also leads to the generation of molecules which mimic nucleotides and become incorporated into our DNA. And so azathioprine messes with our cellular DNA and this has been associated with an increased risk of lymphoma. And whilst cells within our bone marrow are going to be vulnerable to the effects of azathioprine because they are constantly dividing and making use of the cell cycle, azathioprine is not working selectively in the bone marrow. It's going to be working throughout the body. And of course, you're likely aware that azathioprine metabolism in individuals is influenced by an enzyme known as TPMT thiopurine methyltransferase. Some people have a genetic deficiency of this enzyme, which puts them at risk of severe myelosuppression when prescribed azathioprine. So, like I say, 
Azathioprine lends itself to a dedicated tutorial and it's easy to see why science went in search of something more specific and less DNA damaging, thereby discovering mycophenolate. So that was mycophenolate in a nutshell. I hope that helps you with your MCQs and doctor life. And if you are studying for your written exams, be sure to check out all of the awesome resources over on our website, including our free seven day kickstart challenge where you will have access to our signature GN tutorial. This will teach you everything you need to know about GN in just 40 minutes. I'm not kidding. You will actually understand GN in under one hour. So you can answer those MCQs, boss dog to life, and then get back to doing whatever you would rather be doing. <laughs> and as part of that, you'll also have access to the deluxe version of Immunology The War Is Over. That version is ad-free immunology learning with handy summaries, PDFs, and MCQs to reinforce everything you've learned. And if you do enjoy our content, you will love the Deluxe membership where you will have access to all of our animated tutorials covering those tricky topics like transplant immunology, renal tubular acidosis, thrombotic microangiopathy and tubular physiology, the list goes on. And you'll also have access to my brand new live teaching series for the written exam where we will hang out together online once a month and conquer renal medicine for your exams. So go ahead, click the link below, head on over to the website, snag those freebies and check out our deluxe membership. I would love to see you there and otherwise stay tuned here on YouTube for some more high yield learning. Bye!